So let's open our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians and chapter 1. I was speaking with Scott. I appreciate you making a place for me to be able to come today on short notice, relatively short notice. But I was talking to Scott, and he happened to hear a, a similar message to this, only because even if I speak on the same thing, it's never exactly the same. But when I was talking to him about today and what to speak on, I asked him, did he think this would be a good message uh, for today, a good subject? And he said, yes. So you can't blame him for the delivery of the message, but you can only blame him for the topic that's chosen uh, if you have fault with it. But I want to speak this morning on the timing of the Lord's return. I believe it's good from time to time to go over fundamental things that we believe for a number of reasons, we need to revisit these from time to time, but also as, a, as new generations come along and people uh, come to faith in Christ and so on, it's good for young people and others and all of us to, to know that we believe what we believe because the Bible teaches it. Now that might sound very basic, but when it comes to certain things about the such as the timing of the Lord's return, you will discover, it won't take you very long, that there are a lot of different views about the coming and the return of the Lord and the timing of it. But it's important for us to establish with our young people that while not everybody will agree with what we might see as the timing of the Lord's return, it's important to know that we believe it because that's what the Bible teaches. That's We're basing our belief not on a book somebody wrote or on something somebody said hundreds of years ago, but we're basing it on our understanding of the Scripture so that we have a biblical basis for what we believe. And people can disagree on certain aspects of that, but at least we can say, well, we're, we're, we're communicating it this way because we believe this is what the Bible teaches. And so uh, that's the way we want to look at it this morning when it comes to the timing of the Lord's return. So we read here of the church at Thessalonica in chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians and how they were converted. It says in verse 9 that they themselves show us of what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, when you go back over the history of the church at Thessalonica and how it was founded, you glean from the information that's given to us in the book of Acts that Paul was there a relatively short period of time, as, as short as three weeks, possibly a little bit longer, but we only have real record of him being there for about three weeks or so. But in the three weeks that he was there, he preached the gospel, people were saved, they went from serving idols to serving the true and living God. I mean, if you let that settle in into your thinking for a minute and think of the impact that one day these people are going down to idol temples and worshiping statues and images and sacrifices to all these things, and then they're not. They're, they're beginning to meet with a, together with a group of people in the name of Jesus Christ. Remarkable. What a testimony just in itself that would have been. And in the relatively short period of time that Paul was there, he taught them a lot of deep truths. Sometimes we think, well, when people are new believers in Christ, we've got to you know, kind of feed them uh, you know, baby food in a sense and spoon feed them, but... Man, Paul, he, he lit right into him with heavy-duty doctrine. And, and he, he really just, you know, he you begin to read of some of the topics that he taught them. But he particularly emphasized to them the return of Jesus Christ. And so when you read 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, uh, you'll find two things there, among others. You'll find, first of all, that Every chapter in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians has a reference to the coming again of Christ. And then you'll find that um, he had to write 2 Thessalonians because when he taught them the truth about the Lord's return, 
both in First and Second Thessalonians, they got hold of it real good, or it got hold of them real good, whichever way you want to think about it, because he had to write and correct some of their thinking, which is the reason we have certain passages in First Thessalonians. The classic one is chapter 4 that uh, talks about uh, the rapture of the church, which we'll mention in a bit. And the reason for writing that was these people were saying, well, you, know, you taught the Lord's coming. What's going to happen to these people who've already died and the Lord isn't back yet? And so you had to write to instruct them with that. And then by the time he writes Second Thessalonians, uh, again, in part to say, look, yes, the Lord's coming. Doesn't mean you go sit on the rooftop and just wait for him to come. You're to be out and working and doing what the Lord would have you to do. So they had gotten hold of it so good or it got hold of them so good that they thought, well, the Lord's coming. There's no point in doing anything. We might as well just sit around and wait because, you know, the Lord's coming. Well, it's true the Lord is coming. But will you be working and watching and waiting and doing those things that you should do up until that time? And so um, in writing to these Thessalonians, he taught them a good deal about the return of the Lord Jesus. One last thing about that. That is that many people think that the letter to the Thessalonians or the book in the Bible we call Thessalonians maybe was one of the earliest that Paul wrote. So again, very early in the time of the New Testament, he's giving these truths about the coming again of the Lord. And there's another reason when we think about that is because that is our hope as believers in the Lord Jesus. Now, I am sure, and I wouldn't dare do it this morning, I don't preach politics, I don't preach politics at all, I don't preach them from the pulpit on a Sunday morning in particular, but uh, I'm sure if we were to poll the room this morning, we would find that there are people here who have very strong um, political persuasions, let's say, and certain hopes of things that might happen. We're nearing an election season. And I'm sure that there are certain things that most of us would like to see take place. But having said that, it's helpful to remind ourselves as Christians that our ultimate hope does not lie in the politics of this world. It doesn't lie in who gets elected or who doesn't get elected, even though, you know, we want to see certain things done and right things done. And it doesn't mean we just stick our head in the sand. But we realize as believers that ultimately the hope for this world is the coming again of Jesus Christ. That is our real hope. It's not in reforming the world or in advances in science and technology, as good as those things are. Our hope is in the coming again of the Lord Jesus. Now, did you hand these out in there? You did? Okay, thank you, yes. Um, and so, as those Thessalonians, you see, they were looking, waiting for his son from heaven. Now, when it comes to the Lord's return, it is a fundamental of the faith. And what I mean by that is you cannot really be a believer in Jesus Christ and not believe that the Lord is coming back. And there's a very important reason for that. And it lies in the fact that the Savior himself, Jesus Christ, stood on this planet and said, I will come again. And if, if that's not true, if he didn't know what he was talking about, or if he was deceiving us, or if he was deceived, he couldn't be the Savior. And so you wouldn't have any way to know your sins are forgiven. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have a salvation and you wouldn't have a Savior. So it is vital that we hold to the truth that the Lord is coming again. And all groups of Christians down through the ages have held to that truth in one way manner or another. But while we believe the Lord is coming again, there are a number of different views about when exactly the Lord is coming. And people who hold different views on the timing of the Lord's return, it doesn't mean that they're not true believers in Christ. There are large segments of Christianity that would not agree with a whole lot of what I'm going to say this morning, but it doesn't mean they're not true Christians. Some of them, many of them, 
would put me to shame as far as their Christian lives and their testimony for the Lord is concerned. But you can be a true believer in Christ and differ on certain aspects of the coming of the Lord Jesus. The timing. But once again, I'm going to give you what I believe the Bible teaches about that particular timing, and I'm going to tell you why. And so, like Paul did with those early believers at Thessalonica, we're going to dive into the deep end of the pool and, and, and think about some big concepts in a sense, but hopefully not to try to make it overcomplicated, but to give us a little bit of a better understanding. The Lord's return is, first of all, premillennial. And when we say the Lord's return is premillennial, that indicates a couple of things. It indicates, first of all, that we believe there is going to be a millennium. Now, the word millennium is simply a word that means a thousand. And that is taken from the idea in Revelation chapter 20, where six times a period of time or a length of time is identified as a thousand years. There are basically three areas of belief that all formulate their belief based on this period of time called the millennium. One of the very large segments of Christianity would be those who would be called uh, amillennial in their belief. And so if you think of it this way, there are certain words that if you put an A in front of them, then they, make, they negate the rest of the word or they make it negative. For instance, a theist is a person who believes in God. You put an A in front of that, an atheist is a person who doesn't believe in God, who doesn't believe there is a God. A Gnostic is somebody who said you can know. You put an A in front of that, an agnostic means is someone who says you can't know. So an amillennialist is a person who doesn't believe there's going to be a thousand-year kingdom on this planet where Jesus Christ rules and reigns in that thousand years. And generally, they don't believe there's going to be any future for the nation of Israel, that Israel is never going to have all those promises that have yet to be fulfilled in the prophets in the Old Testament and in the New as well, um, given to them. And you ask yourself, well, how could they arrive at a view like that? Now, we'll talk about that in just a moment, and you'll see. So that's a large group of people. They don't believe there's going to be a kingdom established on this earth lasting a thousand years. They don't believe that that period of time, six times mentioned in Revelation chapter 20, is literal. They believe that the Lord's going to come back and there's going to be sort of a general judgment at the end of the age. A second group of people would be described as post-millennial. And what a post-millennialist believes is that they believe that the kingdom is going to be established um, and then the Lord's going to come. He's going to come after the kingdom is established. And the kingdom is going to be established by the preaching of the gospel going out into all the world. And then there's some variants of that a little bit later on. Now this was a, a view that was popularized prior to World War I and World War II. Well, then you had World War I and World War II, and it didn't look like the future was as bright as the people had thought. But if you, if you go back to the thinking of how this started, you see, we live in, uh, in the last few hundred years in a very remarkable era. It wasn't until the 1800s, basically, that there grew out of Europe primarily what's called the modern missionary movement where people began to leave their countries and go into various parts of the world to preach the gospel. That hasn't always been the case. And, and when that began to happen, and people began to go to all these far corners of the earth preaching the gospel, there were those that saw that verse that's given in the gospels that says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in every nation, and then shall the end come. And they began to think that they were seeing the fulfillment of that. 
that the kingdom was now being brought in through the preaching of the gospel and the Lord was going to come. And then, as I say, there were a couple of world wars and all kind of other things happened. So that view kind of dwindled a little bit and it got kind of amped back up again in recent times under a whole different thing called uh, Christian Reconstructionism, but we won't go into that. The problem is, is that it began to meld together with political movements and so it wasn't just the preaching of the gospel that's going to bring in the kingdom. It was going to be the taking over of society by Christians that was going to bring in the kingdom. And it gets a little bit out there. But believe it or not, there were quite a few people who did hold to that, and, and in more recent times, even some that still do. And then, as I said, the third view, which is the one that I would believe uh, that Scripture teaches, is that the Lord is going to come before the thousand-year reign on earth, and that the coming of the Lord is what is going to start that thousand-year period known as the millennium, that Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign from the very city from which he was rejected, that the promises that were made to Israel in the Old Testament have not all been absorbed by the church. They're going to be literally fulfilled with the nation of Israel in a physical land and in a city of Jerusalem. Now, the reason there's such a divergence of views, it all has to do with how you approach the Scriptures. It all has to do with how a person interprets the Scriptures. And so if you come at the Scriptures and you spiritualize things, I'll give you an example of that, uh, of how that's done. And I'm not making this up. This is how people would approach certain passages like this. So turn with me back to Matthew's Gospel in chapter 10. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, the Lord calls the 12 disciples and uh, sends them forth to go out and preach. And he tells them in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 5, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans don't enter in, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now I'm going to tell you what I believe that means. I believe that means and meant um, don't go to the way of the Gentiles and don't go into the city of the Samaritans and preach only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's what I believe that means. But if you are a person who spiritualizes things, see, when you say spiritualize, at first it sounds good. Oh, it's going to be spiritual. No, that's not what it means. It means to take something that's literal and make something else out of it. So the person who does not believe that there's any difference in the church of this age and the Israel of the past, well, they come at this passage totally different. And they'll look at it and say, well, you see, he's, he's talking about the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So that means only go to the elect. Now you'd know who the elect are if you think like that. I have no idea. Like Spurgeon used to say, it's not like they got a big yellow stripe down their back or something. It, you, you know, you're an elect or something. So, but, but they have to do that because, in other words, they don't want to see any distinction between Israel and the church and so on. I know it's, it may sound a little bit convoluted to you, but that's sort of how they come at it. Uh, and another classic example would be when the Lord Jesus was born in Luke and the announcements made concerning his birth, it's said that she's going to conceive in, your, in her womb. She's going to bring forth a son. His name would be called Jesus. He would be great and be called the son of the highest. I believe that, don't you? They believe that too. But here's where the paths diverge. The rest of the verse says, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. And that's where the path would diverge. Where I would literally interpret that meaning exactly what it says, they have to come out and say, no, it doesn't mean that, it means something else. So they take half the verse as literal, and the other half they spiritualize or spiritualize it away. And so you have to give it some meaning other than what it actually says. Now, I hope that doesn't sound too convoluted in your thinking. 
Um, but if you're not used to that type of thing, I just wanted you to know why it is that you could look at a passage one way and they look at the same passage and end up somewhere completely different is because of how they approach their understanding and interpretation of Scripture. And so the Lord, the timing of the Lord's return, first of all, it's pre-millennial. He's coming back. He's going to establish a kingdom here on earth. But secondly, and maybe even a little bit more controversial in some circles, I'm going to say to you that I believe the Bible teaches that the Lord's return is pre-tribulational, that he's coming back for us before the time of tribulation described in the book of Revelation takes place on this planet, pre-tribulational, that the church, which is his body, will not go through that time of tribulation mentioned and described in the book of the Revelation. And so I'm going to give you four reasons why I, why I believe the Bible teaches us that we who are believers in Christ, truly saved people, will not go through that time of tribulation, that the Lord is coming back prior to that. Before I give you those four reasons, I want to mention one other thing. Um, there was a man that used to be up in the meeting in Birmingham. I won't mention his name here because we're live in front of millions of people. But uh, anyway, um, he you'll know Tim, I think, who I'm talking about. He used to teach Latin. And so I, I knew him from back when Scott and I first met 100 years ago. And uh, I asked him one time about a particular word, and he brought me the Latin, you know, stuff for that. But it's, it's, it's the word that's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So sometimes you'll hear people say, well, you know, the word rapture, you talk about the rapture of the church, and the word rapture, it isn't found in the Bible. Now, the same people who say that, they don't have any problem most of the time talking about the Trinity, which also isn't found in the Bible. But what I tell them is, it is if you look in the right Bible, because it doesn't come from the Greek word, it comes from the Latin word. And so if you were to get a Latin Bible or Jerome's Vulgate or one of those, you would find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that that word for caught up or snatched away is where we get that word rapture from. It comes from that Latin word. And so the rapture of the church, the catching away from off the earth of the church, will take place uh, before the time of tribulation comes upon this planet. The rapture of the church. Now, uh, I was laughing a little bit this morning, but crying inside too, because I hadn't been in a while, and some of your children now are older than they used to be. It does happen, you know. And then it begins to make me think, of, well, I am getting old, you know. So I have to tell sometimes that uh, I am not really a product of the Star Wars generation. I am a product of the Star Trek generation. Not the more recent one, but the older one, you know, the old Star Trek. And I remember we used to watch that program and thought, man, you know, one day science is going to be able to do that. You know, the classic line that people still utter sometimes, you, you might utter it at work or in the world you live in. Beam me up, Scotty. There's no intelligent life down here, you know. <laughs> so you kind of feel like that sometimes. But and you know, and then they'd they'd call for the for them to beam them up, and then you'd see their bodies go. You know, it's like all of a sudden they disappeared, and they went from one place to another, and they were on this planet. And now they're in the spaceship, and and you thought, yeah, you know, one day science will probably be able to do that. And then you tell people, you say, you know, the Lord's coming back one day. And one day you're going to be walking along here on planet Earth and there's going to be a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and you're going to be caught up off of this planet and your body's going to be changed and equipped and fitted to live in eternity and with the Lord. And they're like, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. That could never happen, you know. But they believe that the Star Trek thing could happen, you see. But they don't believe that what the Lord say, says can happen. 
But that's exactly what the Bible says is going to happen. And it's going to happen before the tribulation. Four reasons. Number one, the nature of the tribulation. The tribulation is a period of time that is designed specifically with the nation of Israel in mind. So that when we read in Jeremiah 30 that these are the words the Lord spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah. Alas, that day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it, and so on. The time of Jacob's trouble. That's that time of tribulation. Now you think about that for a moment. And I'm going to tell you a story, but it's a story that comes from the Scripture. So when you read the book of Genesis, you realize that about one-fourth of the, of the book, that is the end of the book, uh, has to do with the life of Joseph, which is pretty remarkable. Because Joseph, as has been said, he's not in the line of Christ, but he's certainly in the likeness of Christ. But there are those that believe, and I would agree with this, that although all of that material has to do with the life of Joseph, it's not so much just a story about Joseph. It's a story about Jacob. And it's the story of how God brings Jacob to the place where he has to recognize the man who was down in the pit and given up for dead has now been raised to this extreme place of power in the land of Egypt. So much so that Joseph makes the statement to his brothers, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. But you see the similarities that you've got a man who's given up for dead, and they, they think he's dead, and then all of a sudden he's raised to the pinnacle of power and prestige and position. How did Jacob get to that place where he left the land of Israel and came to the feet of Joseph. Well, it wasn't during a time of great prosperity. It was during a time of economic crisis in that part of the known world, a worldwide famine in that part of the world, where things got so bad and so severe that Jacob says, we've never seen anything like this. We've never had it this bad. We've got to go to Egypt. We've got to go to that man. It was a time of Jacob's trouble. And that's how it was that God brought Jacob to see that man who had been in the pit. And, you know, the, the brothers there who didn't accept him the first time, but then had to recognize him for who he was. And that story gets played out on a bigger stage in a greater way with the nation of Israel. One day through this time of severity known as the time of Jacob's trouble, there's going to be a remnant in Israel who recognize who Jesus Christ is. The book of Revelation begins in the early verses by saying they're going to look on him whom they've pierced. And I believe at that time that prophetic passage in Isaiah 53 is going to be what they express at that time. Israel as a whole will say he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And they're going to recognize Jesus Christ, and a nation's going to be born in a day, the Scripture says. But it'll be through that terrible time of trouble. It's not that it doesn't involve other people as well, but that whole time of economic crisis that God used to bring Jacob affected the whole known world of that time. God engineering world history to accomplish his purpose for Jacob. And so the time of tribulation designed uh, not so much for the, not for the church at all, but for Israel. Secondly, uh, in regard to that part of the nature of the tribulation, the church is a mystery. Ephesians chapter 3 says that the church was a mystery hidden in God and it couldn't be made known until God chose to reveal it. And so in the ages past, God had a plan. I put it in this kind of a way, but he didn't tell anybody about it. 
It couldn't be known until the New Testament times when, the, when it was revealed. That's what Ephesians uh, 3 tells us, Ephesians 3, 5, and 6, and so on. And so the Old Testament tells us about this time of tribulation, but the Old Testament prophecies don't tell us anything about the church. The church wasn't the subject of Old Testament prophecy. And so if you'll look on the handout that you have, you'll see there that I have in the big print Daniel's prophecy of the 490 years. This church, which was a mystery, uh, makes it like the age we're living in to be a great parenthesis. And if you look at that diagram, you'll understand a little better where, I, where I'm going with this. So without having to get into all the details, Daniel's prophecy that's found in chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, it predicts a period of time, a definite period of time, 490 years. 483 years up until the time that the Messiah is cut off. It's very remarkable prophecy. I preached the last couple of years on the book of Daniel quite a bit. Um, sometimes I find in my study, or even in our men's Bible study that we have every January, um, whatever the subject we take up there is, you know, you have to go in so intently to dig into it. And I start getting so much out of it myself. I'm like, this is good stuff, you know. And so I've preached a lot on the book of Daniel in the past couple of years. But one of the remarkable things about Daniel is that you, uh, you've got people who are critics of the Bible, and they criticize the Bible because they, you may have heard it. Oh, the Bible's full of inaccuracies. The Bible's got contradictions, inaccurate, you know, and all that, until they come to the book of Daniel. Then they say, oh, the book of Daniel, that's too highly accurate. That couldn't have been written before. Then, you know, they, they kind of want it both ways because Daniel's prophecies are so specific in places that, that the critic comes along and says, that ah, couldn't be supernatural revelation. He had to have written that after the fact, which we know is not true. But this prophecy, imagine Daniel prophesied the time of the cutting off the Messiah, that the Jews could know the very time. See, there's all sort of identifying markers about the Messiah, so many that it would be impossible for an imposter to come along and fulfill those if you begin to look at all the things that had to take place. And so Daniel says, 483 years until the Messiah is cut off. That leaves seven years. And that seven years is the time of tribulation. So you see in the Old Testament, if you'll notice the, the line coming down to the circle at the bottom on the diagram, um, that something began this parenthesis, this age in which we're living from God's perspective. And what began it was the birth of the church, which is his body. Something has to close that parenthesis. And I'm suggesting to you that what it is is the removal of the church, which is his bride. That period of time was seen in the Old Testament there to the left of that line. And that period on the right was seen in the Old Testament to the right of the line. But what wasn't seen is the period, the indefinite period of time in which we're living now. And I believe that what's going to close this age off is the removal of the church from this earth. The, um, excuse me, uh, did I give you, how many did I give you? <laughs> I kind of lost my train of thought there. I apologize. Oh, the nature of the tribulation, the nature of the church would have been the second one. I don't think I mentioned the heading of the, the last one had to do with the nature of the church in this age. Third, the absence of the church in the tribulation passages in the book of the Bible, uh, book of Revelation. You will not find the church mentioned in the book of Revelation uh, after chapter 4, at the beginning of chapter 4 or at the end of chapter 3, whichever you prefer. You don't find or see the church in unless you recognize when the Lord comes in Revelation 19, he's coming with his people, not for his people, to the earth. And so the church is not mentioned in that time of tribulation. And then the fourth reason is the very stated teaching of the New Testament itself. Now, Revelation chapter 3, no matter what you think about 
tribulation, there are people who say, well, you're just trying to get out of that time. And I'm like, yeah, you're pretty much right. I don't want to go through it. <laughs> who would in the right mind, you know? But you find a promise that's made to one church in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. And it says, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. I told the story the other day that there's a, there's a man who lives down in Hollywood, Florida. Most people wouldn't know who he is. His name's Dave Winfrey. And Dave is a retired English teacher. But he has a, a I call it a claim to fame, that most uh, people wouldn't be able to do who didn't have a seminary degree. And that is that Dave had an article that was published in a major theological journal and he does not have a degree from any seminary. They very rarely publish things like that. But it was so well done. And it was written on one word. He later did a booklet on, on this very subject. But the one word in the Greek, it's a preposition, is kept from. And it has to do with whether that word means out of or through, which he said it means out of, not through. And he, it was such a well done article that they did publish it. I think it was in Grace Theological Journal or something. And Dave later did a booklet on it. But later, there was another man named, um, what was his name? Gerald Stanford, I think was his name, or Stanton. And he wrote a whole book called Kept from the Hour. And it's all to do with this Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10, that this church of Philadelphia is kept from that hour, out of it. So that's what the Bible teaches. While you're there, if you can do this, Get Revelation chapter 6 in one hand and 1 Thessalonians in the other hand, chapter 1. When you come to Revelation chapter 6, you now have the scene in heaven where the Lamb has come and, and begins to open the scroll which unleashes the judgments of God upon the planet. You come to the end of chapter 6 in verse 15, and it says, The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, every bondman, every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath. And notice these two words, is come. The great day of his wrath is come. Now you keep that, you look back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And verse 10, which says that Jesus has delivered us from the wrath to come. His wrath is come, but we have been delivered from the wrath to come. And along with that, you've got chapter 5 in 1 Thessalonians and verse 9 that says, God has not appointed us to wrath. And so the stating, stated teaching of the New Testament that the church has not been appointed to that time of wrath, the wrath to come. That's what the Thessalonians were taught. That's what I believe. And as was mentioned earlier, that the coming of the Lord is imminent, that there's nothing that has to be fulfilled. There's no prophecy that's awaiting fulfillment. There's nothing to hinder the Lord from coming at any moment. Now, that's a, I almost said that's a, that's a, a big wad of tobacco to chew, but that probably wouldn't be the best thing to say on a Sunday morning in the meeting place, but uh, that's just an expression, you see, that we sometimes use, some of us folks, but um, it's, a, it's a lot to digest, let's put it that way. And having said that, the coming again of the Lord and the rapture of the church, it's not just a doctrine that we stuff away on a shelf somewhere in a bunch of musty old books. It's a truth that's given to us as believers to grip our hearts, to have constantly before us, to encourage us about loved ones who've gone on to be with the Lord, and to challenge us about people we know who are not yet saved and need to get with the Lord before he comes back. 
It's a challenge, isn't it? You know, the, the coming again of the Lord in some ways, I say, is like a two-edged sword. It's what we look forward to and we cry even as they, the, the close of the book of Revelation, even so come, Lord Jesus. But at the same time, we think of loved ones, maybe family members and friends, people we know who aren't saved. And they need to be saved before the Lord comes. And so it should move us and it should motivate us to do everything we can in our efforts by the grace and power of God to get the gospel to those who are unsaved. And whoever might be listening today by any means, are you ready when the Lord Jesus comes back? If he comes today, tonight, are you ready to go with him? The only way you can know you're ready is you know you've trusted Christ as your Savior. You don't want to get left behind. You don't want to get left behind. Let's look to him in a word of prayer. Father, we live in a world that's filled with trouble, and difficulty, and challenges of every kind. But there's one absolute certainty that's before us among the many other certainties we have as believers. And that is the Lord is coming back. And we've got a bright future in front of us. We've got a great hope that not only are we to hold fast to, but it should grip our hearts. It should be a constant reminder, even as we get up every day, that we might think perhaps today, today might be the day the Lord Jesus comes back. May it always burn brightly in our hearts, our minds. May it move our wills to do your work and to do your will in this world in which we live. And again, if anybody's listening who isn't saved, Lord Jesus, we pray that now they do like those Thessalonians, turn to God and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. They too will be waiting expectantly, looking for the return of the Lord Jesus. We give you thanks in his name. Amen.